Let's move on to the first session of the STTP. Uh, Jaya ma'am, shall we start? Uh, yes. Am yeah. I audible? Yeah, ma'am. Uh, so we have with us Ms. Jaya Gupta, research scholar, Bennett University. Ms. Jaya Gupta is an enthusiastic, adaptive, and fast learning person with a broad and acute interest in the discovery of new innovative skills. She com completed her BTEC from JSS Academy of Technical Education, Noida in 2011 and her MTech from Delhi Technological University in 2013. Ms. Jaya is pursuing her PhD in the area of computer vision, deep learning and unmanned aerial vehicle from Bennett University. She has a good teaching experience and has also worked as project associate at IIT Delhi. Ms. Jaya has undertaken different projects and have many publications to her account. She has also served as NVIDIA Deep Learning Institute University Ambassador in Computer Vision and is also a winner in AI and Deep Learning Workshop Hackathon held at Bennett University under Leading AI Program. On behalf of the entire team, I once again bid a warm welcome to you, Ms. Jaya Gupta. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am, for this uh, welcome note. So, uh, Actually, uh, currently I'm doing uh, research in uh, video summarization using reinforcement learning. That's my area of research. So let's come to today's agenda and I'll be covering uh, the broad spectrum of artificial intelligence and machine learning applications and its uh, basic understanding how it works, right? So we'll be covering all of this uh, in my session. So let's start the session without a further ado. So is my slide visible? Is it visible? Not visible. It's, it's visible. OK, thank you. So basically, we will see how artificial intelligence and machine learning are currently changing the world. And there are many uh, new technologies are in this era, like blockchain is there, like uh, computer uh, networking is there, cloud is there. With artificial intelligence and machine learning and cloud computing, we are generating various applications that are uh, important for us and that are that really lies in the zone of uh, IoT, information technology, so Internet of Things, right? So let's see this uh, a little video to understand how artificial intelligence is changing the world. When everything becomes linked with everything else, matter becomes mind and the possibilities become endless. Excuse me, ma'am. Does this video Imagine have an 50 audio billion. Well? Yes, it's audible. Is uh, it's it? not audible here, actually. Oh, okay. So, in that case, we can skip this video. I think uh, it's not taking the sound from this PPT. Right. So, no problem. Okay, ma'am. Let's uh, go on to the topic. So, basically, machine learning is a field of... This is a subfield of artificial intelligence, which basically... Uh, is 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 an ability to program without be uh, it is an ability to uh, generate new things without being explicitly programmed right and whereas artificial intelligence is an umbrella term which actually takes two words which is artificial and intelligence so artificial is something which is not human created and intelligence is something which we have right so when we combine both the things and design that intelligence in a machine that is called artificial intelligence, right? And there is one more term that is deep learning and that deep learning is actually the term which takes a lot more data and a lot more computing power and then delivers something which is phenomenal, right? So let's see what is artificial intelligence timeline and how it has evolved over the years. In 1950s to 1970s, we have Alan Turing and he has proposed the Turing test in which there was a machine and an interrogator and 
there is a human machine and an interrogator both uh, all are sitting in a different room and the interrogator was asking different questions same questions to the computer as well as human being and they are responding to the interrogator and machine in that experiment tried to fool the interrogator that it is a human being so artificial intelligence was the term was coined by McCarthy in 1956 in the Dartmouth conference so this is a picture of a conference there in 1961 to 1970s we have first industrial robot and that is that has replaced the humans in the assembly line right so we all know ford and ford has created its first assembly line right this is a picture of that and then there was a small chatbot which we see uh, nowadays integrated with every other website and it was initially developed during this year nine, during uh, 1964 and the first named of the chatbot was eliza and then there is a mobile robot we are seeing now we have uh, robots in our home for cleaning purposes and many things we are uh, like there's a simple bot that is called uh, Alexa, right? So we are using different bots for our general purpose. And in that time, 1961s to 1970s, many robots were being developed. And Shaky was one of the robots which was developed at Stanford, right? In 1971 to 1990, there was not a large, a good research happened in artificial intelligence. Later, when we had more computing power and enormous data, uh, by 1991 to 2000 there are a lot more researches and we see we all everybody knows that this IBM Deep Blue has defeated Gary Kasparov in chess competition and there was a intelligent robot was Kismat which was emotionally intelligent it means it can uh, capture the expression of a people and can uh, converse accordingly and this was a picture of uh, this Gary Kasparov and defeating sorry this Deep Blue was defeating the Gary Kasparov and this is a picture of Kismat. And there is a small robot named Abo, and that is a pet dog. That's an AI robot, and it is uh, it it can play with our children at home. So these kind of innovations has happened during these years, 91 to 2000. And then 2001 to 2010, we have iRobot, and that is a vacuum cleaning robot. This is the first version of that Roomba and uh, now there are various innovations has happened in this field and uh, many persons have these things at their home for cleaning purpose and now we know, all, already know that the self-driving car innovations are uh, getting at a pace and uh, many uh, things are being developed uh, uh, from different um, companies like google and also this um, Elon Musk uh, company Tesla is also working on this self-driving vehicle, right? So these are few innovations happened in 2001 to 2010, but these are far better than what was happening uh, in 1950s to 1960s, right? So now I also know IBM Watson, Apple Siri, Eugene, that is a chatbot passing Turing test, and Alexander, that's an intelligent virtual assistant that has been developed in 2011 to 2020. This is a picture of IBM Watson and Siri, and this is a Eugene Goodsman, that's a, a chatbot that passed the Turing test, right, with the voice assistant capabilities. We already know Alexa and AlphaGo already beat the world's best Go player kg in 2017 so with all these innovations we have a, a good hands-on research on ai technologies and also a large innovation in deep neural network architectures that are behind all these innovations so in this program in this talk i'll be covering all the concepts related to those ai innovations and deep neural network architectures right so in 2020, we hit with Corona and now the things have been developed and we are, we can see the developments are happening in such a manner that we can talk to any person and there are so many AI conferences held over the world and uh, the drugs are discovered using artificial intelligence and it is also has a large span, a large benefit in healthcare as well during these span, right? So now there are many other innovations which are included like Moxie, that's an emotional, a social emotional companion for kids. And because the people felt alone in this period and there was a high depression rate. 
so a large chatbots a large variety of applications or products are developed to keep the people engaged so these are few applications that were happened in 2020 and there is a trial directory that's a ai enabled service to look for clinical trials right so now after 2021 and now we are proceeding with enormous and good innovations in the field of artificial intelligence right so let's proceed with it first we need to ask ourselves what things would be better if they were done 24 cross 7 because we need rest we are humans but machines don't need it so what would be better if it done at scale and what would be benefit from greater consistency and what would be possible if we leveraged broader expertise to see beyond our current limits so these are good candidates for artificial intelligence we need to ask these questions by ourselves before uh, any innovation or a development so what would happen if the products are recommended to you on amazon and flipkart snapdeal and many other shopping websites and we listen to music on youtube and there will be recommendations side by side according to that music when we chat with customer support we are actually chatting with the chatbots and we when we ask our uh, amazon eco to change our playlist or we we talk it to, to set a reminder or call anyone so let's see what happens when let's see what human what is a difference between a human set of thinking and a machine so human naturally can work with a small amount of data and hun and have a knowledge about domain and good image recognition capabilities let's see machines machines can make intensive computations computations and know only numbers and strings right so what will happen if we combine the good aspects of both human as well as machines right then we can create a machines that are very innovative and helpful to human in their daily course these are few applications i some of them i have already discussed and there are some newspaper cuttings as well now deep face is working and closing to gap to human level performance in face verification it means what we have is our strength of pattern recognition and machines are getting a really good pace to that and these are few applications and good uh, journals and books are coming out in the field of artificial intelligence right and also there are many uh, eminent researchers who has warned artificial intelligence could end mankind but this would happen after so many years now we are currently in the era of artificial neuro intelligence that's a type of artificial intelligence i'll be covering that in few sli- in the later slides and so this neuro intelligence is actually benefiting uh, human being and human race and we are actually currently in the world where artificial intelligence is providing assistance to us but if we will be developing in this space and we already know that there are some cases happened on facebook data center that the two chatbots two machines two servers started talking to each other and if these things will happen more in future and artificial intelligence will empower everything then there will be a risk and to a mankind right so we would be more uh inclined towards the fair and good artificial intelligence that's that's fair there should be fairness in artificial intelligence that it would assist human being not super power it right so let's see the basic fundamentals of machine learning it is a process by which a system improves performance from experience right this is a definition by tom mitchell which says that machine learning is the study of algorithms that improve their performance p at some task t with experience e let's uh, understand this in a simpler manner like if we perform some task and after performing some task like lifting a bottle or something like this so we do some task and after experiencing our performance would improve right so in these terms we will talk about various examples like if we improve on a task like there is a task of playing checkers and the performance p that's a percentage of games won against an arbitrary opponent where experience is playing practice games against itself so any problem can be broken down to these three fundamental concepts one is task another one is performance metric another one is experience 
and this is the how we learn right and if we break down things into sub goals we can further actually design it in a machine and that machine will become artificially intelligent so let's take a different example where t is recognizing handwritten words p is a percentage of words correctly classified and e is a database of human labeled images of handwritten words right so these are three different broken down task of three different broken down aspects of a particular problem right let's proceed now so there we have a traditional artificial intelligence that was rule based and we need to provide data as well as the features it means we have to design problem for a particular subject matter and then we get the output in terms of uh, our requirements right but in machine learning what we provide is the data as well as output and what we get is the features of the program outcomes right so machine learning takes a lot more data and recognizes things by itself whereas in the traditional artificial intelligence we need to handcraft we need to provide handcrafted features it means we need to provide everything data as well as features to a machine and then we get the output right so these two approaches are reciprocal and alan in 1947 alan turing said that what we want is a machine that can learn from experience right so currently we are actually working in this uh, domain only let's see broadly what are the types of artificial intelligence so i already tell that artificial neural intelligence is the era we are currently living in which is specialized in one area and solves one problem whereas there is a one more thing that is artificial general intelligence that refers to a computer as smart as human so it is has it has rivaling uh, properties to the human right then after surpassing what will happen in artificial general intelligence uh, era we will go to artificial super intelligence era that an intellect that is much smarter than the human brain in every field that nowadays we see in sci-fi movies right so we are proceeding in this path only but we have to keep in mind that ai should be fair then there are some types three types of machine learning one is supervised learning one is unsupervised learning and one is reinforcement learning so let's see everything in detail supervised learning is a area where teacher is present which provides the label for corresponding data it means we need to we will have the access of data as well as its output and depending upon that we will further divide the category into two things that is classification and one is regression so if we have the output which is a number or a continuous value that is a, a regression problem and if y is categorical or discrete valued variable then we have the problem of classification right then another field is unsupervised learning unsupervised learning where no teacher is present it means we do not have labels or outputs corresponding to a, to the data so the thing we can do a machine can do is to cluster the data based on its properties right so there is no training will be given to the machine the objective is to find the hidden patterns in the data and then we have another field of machine learning that is reinforcement learning that enables an agent to learn in an interactive environment by trial and error method using feedbacks from its own actions and experiences so this is more like us we how we learn we actually learn by trial and error method and if we get the reward we keep on doing those things and if we get punishment we just switch to different uh, action or plan so this is a simple maze problem where this is a, a rat and it is trying to find the way to the cheese and it has some obstacles as well as uh, some charges there which which can give it a shock so this problem can be converted to break it down into further um aspects that can be agent or uh, that as a reward and punishment one is environment and some are actions so when the agent will uh, performs then when the agent will perceive the environment it performs some actions like up down left right on the environment it can get some reward or a punishment so based on this uh, analysis and thinking that uh, we have to provide a optimal path we have to uh, consider an optimal path through which the rat will move to the cheese right 
So let's see uh, these three different uh, learning algorithms in a paradigm of difficulty. So we have the information and that what happened is basically concerned with unsupervised learning, which is a field of descriptive analytics. Whereas what will happen is a predictive analysis that's insight and that's the supervised learning techniques. And what can happen, what can we make it happen? How can we make it happen? So that is prescriptive analysis and that's a foresight and this is basically dealt by reinforcement learning. So how can we make it happen, right? So that's reinforcement learning because it works on trial and error method. We do not have a previous or historical data with us. We have just environment as well as an agent that can be a human, that can be a robot, a mouse. We have seen an example of it. That can be anything, right? So it can work in a particular environment and look for its ways to travel and find an optimal solution of the problem. Let's see unsupervised learning. We already seen that it sees the data and find the patterns in it based on the pattern it clusters the data into different uh, like clusters right so these are few application areas where unsupervised learning is useful like organizing computing clusters social networking analysis astronomical data analysis as well as market segmentation like we see there is an example i can uh, tell you that you can connect with like in amazon we do shopping and we get uh, many recommendations in the in, in, there is some noise coming from somewhere I'm sorry, there's some noise, right? So we have recommendations and collaborative um, purchasing patterns we can see in the Amazon, right? So that's an example of unsupervised learning. Then there is supervised learning. That is, uh, there are two types of it. We already seen one is regression, another one is classification. So here we see the example of it. So you can see there is the, in the x-axis, we have years through 1970s to 2020. And in the y-axis, we have the Arctic sea ice extent that's actually currently depleting. So we see that if we plot the data and then we put a line, that's a line we have studied in our ninth or 10th standard, that's a straight line or a line that actually uh, fit on the data. Like we, we look for such polynomial equations that actually fit the data and that's the regression thing we are currently doing and it is able to uh, if we have some new year and new data, it can predict based on that year that how much will be the Arctic ice extent. So that's a regression problem. Another thing is classification. So we, we already see that regression has this numbers like uh, continuous valued uh, as a Y. Uh, if this output variable Y will be having number or a continuous value, right? And in the classification, we have Y value that is categorical. Categorical means it can have like two categories or more than two categories. If we have two categories, that is called logistic regression or we can say classification, right? So there is an example of this uh, breast cancer that can be malignant or benign. So its tumor size is on X axis and we have these two classes. One is benign and another one is malignant. So this um, supervised learning is able to predict some function effects that could be a straight line here and which divides both the classes separately so that if new data arrives, it is able to map like to which Y category it belongs to, right? That is a supervised learning paradigm. Let's see reinforcement learning. So given a sequence of states and actions with uh, delayed rewards or rewards, we output a policy. Policy is an optimized uh, path that agent has to follow to reach to an outcome, right? So policy is a mapping from a state to action that tells you what you do in a given state. So there are a few examples of reinforcement learning that can be credit assignment problem, game playing, a robot in a maze and balancing a pole on your hand. So uh, we know there is a framework of OpenAI gym there are many algorithms are provided by Google DeepMind and those are games actually currently developed uh, which apply different reinforcement learning uh, algorithms such as GQN, Arctic Policy Gradient. So these are different algorithms in the paradigm of reinforcement learning which actually helps an agent to look for an optimal path. 
So this is a simple architecture we already discussed. Let's skip this here. So let's see a classic example of a task that requires machine learning. And if you see these numbers, these are handwritten digits and it's very hard to say what makes a two. So if we mark that, so we have these uh, handwritten digits which look like two. So this is the problem at, uh, of machine learning. Like here we actually need machine learning to solve these kinds of problems of handwritten digit classification. Right, so uh, there is uh, already algorithms are developed by Lee Kun in this field, and he has designed Lee Net model, which is able to solve this problem. Right. So let's see some of the machine learning algorithms such as artificial neural network, decision tree, SVM, name-based classifiers, K nearest neighbors, K means there are random forests. That's uh, ensemble techniques and dimensional reduction algorithms like um, um, uh, PCALDA, right? And there are XG boosting algorithms. So these are algorithms which are really useful to find out the prediction as well as class to actually solve classification and prediction problems, right? So let's see few problems in here. So we'll be mostly covering artificial neural network because we need to understand what are the impact of deep learning in the field of artificial intelligence and how it is able to solve real world problems. So rest are machine learning problems. So these are actually statistical uh, methods or algorithms which are able to solve a particular problem and provide a regression or a classification solution depending upon your problem introduction, right? So let's see this artificial neural network where we have an input layer, a hidden layer and output layer. So in all these layers, we have neurons. Neurons are actually a simpler unit it's it's already biologically in we have in our brain and now we have artificial neurons that we study to understand how they work to solve complex problems so this is our deep learning architecture and it's actually how it it actually solves and how it sees a person so in the first layer we have small features that can be a lines or straight lines or some ridges and then these features get combined in the subsequent layers to prepare a face and that face can further be identified as like this is identification uh, problem so that face can be further identified and can match with other faces present and then we can provide access to that person that's a complete project idea so that's a deep learning deep neural network architecture which can solve such problems the face recognition thing so let's see the verticals of artificial intelligence applications. So it can be applicable. It can be applied to product recommendations and e-commerce websites. We have applications of artificial in uh, artificial intelligence in uh, agriculture as well as healthcare, in production, in finance and banking, um, and actually manufacturing because um, many robots are currently used to develop cars and on the assembly line so they actually do the things by themselves like painting brushing and fix, fixing different parts of a car or a product so it's it's widely used in manufacturing as well as in healthcare uh, in game and entertainment as well in space and research right so it is used in every domain aspect we currently touch we, we usually touch in so these are the broadly, if we divide the broadly, the applications of artificial intelligence or deep learning. So it is in the field of computer vision, speech and audio and natural language processing. So we have these different wide areas, which, which have the various applications like precision agriculture, learner profiling, video captioning, exploring patterns from satellite images, image detection in healthcare, identifying specific markers in genomes, creating art and music and recommendations, behavior prediction, etc. So these are few popular artificial intelligence applications and currently uh, the uh, most uh, effective re, uh, research areas where people can work and produce good results as well as papers. So these are the three main areas where deep learning can be prominently applied. One can be detection, one can be prediction, another can be generation, right? So we can detect something in speech and text as well as an image. We can detect the human gait or personality or behavior 
and there are also applications in abuse and fraud that can be a fraud like online fraud or a message spam like these things will be uh, covered under detection whereas another category is prediction where we have recommendations individual behavior and conditions and collective behavior prediction or recommendations right so in the third category we have generation so that is generation of visual art music text or design so reinforcement learning is uh, mostly used for this generation task and we have um, GANs also which are producing very good results in this area whereas in prediction we can apply unsupervised learning techniques right we can apply some supervised learning and semi-supervised learning in in collaboration with the uh, GANs etc so that can do a good prediction task for a complex real world problems whereas in detection we pro usually take help from supervised learning techniques and that can do our work because we have historical data we have labels uh, when we do this detection right so how and why it has taken off now because now we have more computing power which is available due to nvidia gpus like there are google tpus are also available apart from nvidia so we have a large computing power in our hand and that's online too like with the help of cloud computing we are using it online right and we have a large amount of labeled data even we have a large data and as well as a large amount of labor data as well nowadays because we have mobile phones and things we are producing a lot more um, digital data available with us right and other than this uh, uh, largely there are innovations happening every second in the field of artificial intelligence and deep learning so we have apis built-in functions and modules prepared for us so we just need to plug and play those modules to solve real world problems that's why it has taken off now right with the help of different neural network architectures like initially we have vgg 16 and 19 architectures now we have ResNet and other is it advanced architectures that are able to uh, win the ImageNet challenges in the 2016 and 19 with a complex neural network architecture so this is how we have a, a good variety of algorithms prepared apis data as well as high computing power so with the combination of all of these we can do smart innovations right the features uh, like how the we can see what are features or input vector in an in a data right how we can perceive that data so uh, features if we take the category of housing prices so we have features in the form of number of rooms housing area air pollution distance from facilities economic indexity etc so if the problem is of uh, spam detection so we have presence or absence of certain email headers or email structure the language the frequency of specific terms like we see nowadays in our gmail there are three categories and automatically the mail comes and it goes to spam folder right so automatically they've applied the spam detection with our emails noise speech recognition so we have devices like google assistant siri alexa uh like in our surroundings and they are able to uh they are able to catch our speeches and able to answer in human language so what are the features they actually select is noise ratios length of a sound and re relative power of sound also some filter matches right so there are uh, many different categories of the problems are here and according to those categories how the features can be uh, used to actually apply these features in a machine learning algorithm to get the desired output right so if we look for an image example or a video recommendations so in a video we have text matches like uh, if the text is present in a video then ranking of a video interest overlap history of a scene videos and browsing patterns etc in images we have pixel values curves and edges because these features are really very important when we have a large amount of data and we need to understand that data then we need to extract features right so this is actually the most prominent step so if we put together all of the things then we have this machine learning life cycle in the first phase we collect the training data and the second that data gathered continuously from the environment sensors and online behaviors third data is aggregated and harmonized like data is actually prepared and clean for our purpose 
Then in the fourth step, we apply machine learning frameworks to process that data. In the fifth step, we look for patterns and trends that are uh, revealed for generating the insights, right? In the sixth step, which system take different actions to drive value, it means new action is used as an input to improve self-learning of the system. Right. So till the fifth, five step, fifth step, we actually uh, generate our models, and in the sixth step, we are actually doing the prediction as or recommendation on the generated model. Right. So a deep neural network architecture can have more than one hidden layer, like we have in here. So let's understand now a single neuron. Now this is a bit late. This slide has come late actually. So I was uh, tend to explain this in the earlier uh, slides. Right. Let's uh, explain this thing now. So these are different features here that can be a screen size depending upon these features, hard disk size, processor speed, RAM size or a battery time. We are now uh, see what will be the cost of a computer, right? So providing upon these features, every feature is associated with some weight to a neuron. This is a single, this is a half portion of a neuron which actually sums up all the weighted sums of these features. That's X1, W1, X2, W2 and so on. And this is a bias which is nothing but, a, but actually a threshold which actually looks for a... So if you see this equation, this is nothing. This is Y is equals to MX plus C and the C is a threshold which actually looks for uh, how we fit that line or our curve in the uh, in a particular on a particular data right so after taking the weighted sum of all the features we actually uh, apply an activation function over that sum this g is an activation function here what it does it actually uh, it actually relates to our uh, desired output so if the activation function is a sigmoid function then the curve uh, ranges from 0 to 1 then we have a logistic regression right and if this activation function is a relu function then we can have a continuous value data at our end so we can use that also for regression purpose so this is how we produce a desired output y right so when we have a single neuron this is a forward propagation i have discussed with you there is one more thing that is a backward propagation what it does because initially these weights were random and this bias was random so uh, when we train our model then we have back propagation algorithm and which actually uh, set these weights and so that we are able to produce the good results uh, a good prediction model right and that when we back propagate before that we should have actual value of y that is an actual output and this is a desired output then we can calculate an error between the actual and as well as, well as desired output that's mse mean square error and this error will be propagated uh, back to the model right and where all the weights are actually uh, updated with a equation we'll be discussing further using gradient descent algorithm right so let's see what are the activation functions we can use in here. So one activation, most popular activation functions are ReLU that are rectified linear units and sigmoid softmax or 10H functions. These, we have to keep in mind that these functions should be differentiable. It means non-linear activation functions help you to bring non-linearity in the system, right? That's a desirable because we are actually summing up all the values and providing uh, the activation function on it, right? So to transform and squash your input to a different space or domain to some kind of thresholding that is actually regulated by this, that B, that is bias available uh, with our calculations we have do, done in the previous slide, right? So this is an example of sigmoid function and this is the mathematical equation of sigmoid function. So when we when the z is very large it means we have a large sum then e to the power minus z is close to zero and then we have the value of the output as one right and if this z is very small then this thing will be large right and then if we have a large number in here then the whole uh, thing will uh, close to zero right then the predicted output will be a zeroth class so this is how activation function works, sigmoid activation function works. And now we have ReLU and leaky ReLU functions. I'm sorry, right? 
So rectify linear unit is a default activation function that are currently used now. If we see the left part of the function, you can see that is non-zero but almost zero. To so resolve the issue of dead neurons, we will use leaky rule function, leaky ReLU functions. So why this function is very helpful because it actually truncates all the negative values and only pass only let it pass the positive values from the um, from the network, right? Because if we see for images, we do not have negative values. We have a maximum value as uh, like for a grayscale image, we have maximum value as 255 and minimum value as zero. So if the things are being generated, which are producing if due to weights, the produced numbers are negative, then leaky ReLU functions actually truncate those um, negative values from the system and only keeps uh, the positive value to pass in. Right. Whereas leaky ReLU function, it actually actually allows some small uh, weights because sometimes due to ReLU function, there are um, and there is no more training in the data, no more training in the further layers because the derivative becomes very small when we do the Brock propagation. So to keep the things alive, sometimes leaky ReLU is very helpful. So let's see how images can be taken as a data to our system. So this is a eight cross eight cross three image. Three is the RGB channel we can see in here. Eight cross eight is the size of a image. So if we multiply all the things, then eight, eight cross eight is 64. And if we multiply 64 with three, we have 192 values. So these are 192 values, which are flattened as an input, right? Input vector. So this type of, uh, input can also be taken uh, for a simple neural network, right? But actually, uh, let, let me complete this first. So if we have multiple inputs of such type, then what we can do, like these are the input values we had, this column has containing all the values where we will having more, like there will be more images for training purpose. So if we have M number of images, so all the images are arranged in a column fashion here and the particular pixel value of an image is arranged in a row value, right? So this is how we are getting a matrix of M cross N in here, which is containing all the input images with their corresponding values. Like that can be uh, features, if we are, if we'll take uh, normal data and that, that can be pixel values if we take image data, right? So now this is the shape of our output. So for every corresponding image, we have a corresponding label with us, right? So these are different labels. And if we put all the labels in columns, arrange them in a column, so that matrix uh, will be of size one cross M. So this is how we arrange our data before training. So if we have uh, some neurons in here, which have two things, one is ZX that is a summation function and one is AZ that is a activation function. And if we do the, uh, like if we provide all the connections between uh, our input pixels with these uh, five neurons, then we have how many connections we'll be having in here. So we'll be having uh, the neurons five cross 192 connection as well as if here what we did is uh, just ignore the biases but if we'll have biases then we have plus b like plus five connection plus five more uh, number and that will be total number of parameters uh, available uh, to train when we train this model right so this is a final activation function that can be here it is true or false it means it is here uh, sigmoid activation function we can use other activation functions such as uh, softmax right so that can be used for uh, more than two class classification problem right so there's an example of derivative how we calculate the derivative because it is it will be helpful to understand how we calculate the derivative of the error that we have seen in the previous slides we will be calculating msc that's a mean square error and we have to calculate the derivative of that error to propagate it to the previous layers right so this is an example of that and for the back propagation we usually use gradient descent algorithm that actually looks for the global minima in the problem itself and that's go actually the 
um, the objective function is uh, indicated is actually uh, represented with J W B where W are the weights and B is the bias uh, available in a in our uh, equation, right? So by optimizing by mag minimizing this uh, error function objective function we reach at the global minima and that's our final answer that we look for like to minimize error right so this is how the weights will be changed when we propagate the bias in the network so this is the equation we mathematically write it in this manner so w is equal to w minus alpha a partial uh, derivative of w and b upon uh, derivative of w right so this uh, weight updation and bias updation is the process which we do in every epoch to reach global minima where alpha is actually a learning rate which we will decide which decides that how fast or slow we are going towards the global minima and uh, we have two options either take the value of alpha is a small or a large or that problem should be set according to empirically we have need to set that problem according to our uh, uh, experiment or uh, data right so if alpha is too small it it there will be a slow convergence right so uh, that's not very beneficial to take alpha as too small and if the alpha value will be too large then it will keep on bouncing in the whole curve and we actually may miss global minima so what we do uh, in our experiments is to take alpha uh, a large in the beginning and then we keep on decreasing the value of alpha like we can set alpha to 0.1 in the beginning and then we keep on decreasing to 0.01 to 0.0001 so this is how when it is about to reach to the global minima it will actually look for um, it will take small steps to reach the solution right so this is a actually two layer neural network. So we already discussed one layer neural network architecture. Let's discuss this. Uh, it will be covered very easily. So here we have three features with us in the input layer and with all the three features, we have calculated the weights as, as well as uh, this is the activation function associated with every weight, right? Uh, every neuron, right? So when this activation function will be further provided to the final neuron we have which will decide what kind of output we'll be getting in so there a you can see that is actually the activation function we are after applying the activation function the value we will get will be uh, provided to the next layer as a and the weights will be uh, w1 right w2 and so on so this is how we calculate uh, different weights and the bias sorry different um, activation function at each layer at, at every node right so when we apply softmax functions I already told you that there are multiple categories then we usually apply softmax function and uh, let's see the um, mathematical function of the softmax, fun softmax function this is actually e to the power x upon sigma of e to the power x so if we have a z value as this summation after some layer l we are getting this kind of z value then uh, we will apply the softmax activation function in this manner and after applying this we get these values and here is the thing we are currently focused in so the maximum probability we are getting out of it will be taken as one and rest of the probabilities will be provided zero values so this is a hard maximum we are applying in here so basically it why it is applied to multi-class problem because it can provide probabilities at the end and those probabilities can be further um, transformed into hard numbers like one or zero or we can if there are more than two classes then there would be uh, maximum probability as one and next one will be uh, like some other number two three four like this so we have uh, um, this softmax functions works like this right so now we see just give me a second So if we see our different um, deep neural network architectures, like I already discussed one example of Lee Kun, which is able to uh, actually 
produce an architecture for handwritten digit recognition. Similarly, here we can see uh, the face recognition example. There, this from this phase, a low level features are extracted like edges or ridges, and then those uh, low level features are further combined to produce mid level features like eyes, nose, mouth, ears, etc. And later, these mid level features will be combined in different fashions and different orders, and we'll get high level features. So, this all can be done using uh, deep neural network architectures then that can be. Which is 16 ResNet, Google Net, etc. Right? So, what is happening is actually the extraction of different features from the input. Let's see an advanced topic in this domain only that is autoencoders. So, autoencoders are feed forward neural network architectures that learn to predict the input itself in the output. It means we provide input. The input we are here uh, providing here will be regenerated in the output. So uh, you might be thinking, what is the significance of that? So it actually generates a hidden uh, representation of the input in the middle layer, and that is actually compressing the data in a in a shorter dimension, right? In a lower dimension. So this is very important applications for some of the problems, right? So. Um, yeah, there are many cool applications uh, which are based on autoencoders. Let's see some of those applications. So autoencoders are also used are used for anomaly detection. So like credit card frauds can be uh, detected using autoencoders. There are the features such as time, amount, etc. can be learned using an autoencoder. And the training autoencoder will aim to minimize the reconstruction error of the training data. So because we are uh, generating on getting the input, we are generating the same regenerating the same input from this hidden pattern, right? So this reconstruction loss, we have to keep in mind that when it, the uh, autoencoder for this anomaly detection will basically aim to minimize this reconstruction loss of the training data, right? So testing for the testing purpose, we need to provide uh, the transaction from the input and we look for the transaction with higher reconstruction error and that will be labeled as credit card credit card frauds. And we need to put some threshold to understand that to, to actually separate that. Right. So let's see uh, a very uh, version of autoencoders. So this was vanilla autoencoders. We were uh, currently looking into this is vanilla autoencoder. And let's go to denoising autoencoders, which actually if, if there are uh, noise present with the input data, so denoising autoencoders can remove that noise from the uh, input image. They actually look for uh, the data distribution, right? And also some, it actually uh, removes some of the neurons from the layers and this, uh, that is how they are able to uh, reduce the noise from the image right or um, or a sound so that's how denoising autoencoders works uh, i give you a complete idea how they works right and they can be denoising autoencoders are also used for speech enhancement because uh, when we talk in a gathering the sound is coming from the back end or somewhere so in that area we can apply denoising autoencoders for speech enhancement purpose right so they are also used for music voice separation so there are um, you know application areas like there is something some music is going in the background and people are talking some some really important lectures so autoencoders can denoising autoencoders can be utilized there to separate the noise from the lecture like the, if we look at the output there are uh, recent researches are going on in this area because this is a very important field where uh, this is a field of natural language processing and many researches are being happened in this area since 2019 onwards right when we have this alexa and the things are coming uh, very fast uh, very good products are coming in this range so this thing is very important even the headphones nowadays coming in the market are having these capabilities to to do active noise cancellation so many machine learning or deep learning algorithms can also be utilized there as well right then we have convolutional autoencoders so these convolutional autoencoders are actually generating the same image 
uh, as an output but they are producing this edge that is a hidden generation hidden or compressed form of this image features so this is a very useful uh, thing we can get out of convolutional autoencoders and it's it's look like r glass so it is referred as r glass model right so they can also be used for anomaly detection like uh, we have um in in cracks in railway lines there are cracks and those cracks can be uh, taken the data set can be prepared out of those cracks and then uh, this convolutional auto encoders can be applied to that research problem and we can get uh, get uh, the uh, hidden compression of the data and that can be also uh, reduced using uh, these uh, denoising auto encoders right so let's proceed further and this is the thing that are currently generating a large applications nowadays that is generative adversarial network there are two things in this network one is generator model and another one is discriminator model right so discriminator task is to like let's first see the generator model it actually learns to capture the data distribution this generator actually captures the data distribution uh, we provide as an input and the discriminator model estimates the probability that a sample came from the data distribution rather the model distribution right so it discriminator works as a interrogator like if we compare that with the Turing machine so this actually uh, there the data is coming from both the um, both the sources and it actually passes uh, on only the it actually um, uh, detects that it, that data is real or a fake data right so that's the function of discriminator basically it is a min max game where two persons are playing like one of this one is this and discriminator task is to uh, like uh, like work on which one will win right depending upon the data it is getting and its distribution so some of the applications of generative adversarial networks are enum characters A character of a person can be generated as a enum character like your fix will be transformed like this or a cycle GAN where the style will be transferred between this uh, horses and zebra right even super resolution so we can see the images with lower resolution can be converted to high resolution images image in painting so there are very good applications i have seen on linkedin people are generating nowadays many libraries are available to do this task image in painting and this is the task which is really helpful for various online e-commerce websites where this post guided person image generation is um, required right so these are uh, with this image uh, poses or the different points over the uh, the image will be figured out and when these points or di distributions are actually changed the different poses of a person will be generated right so these are the different application areas of generative adversarial networks some are uh, like fake and uh, real celebrities like you have seen this example already over the internet text to image generation right so this is a text this flower has a long thin yellow petals and a lot of uh, yellow anthers in the center and with this text the images of the sunflower will be generated right pix to pix model is really very important for uh, instant segmentation and image segmentation right recoloring etc this is next frame prediction these are all the applications of generative adversarial networks as well as emoji generators so people are using this for fun purposes while uh, talking in online platforms let's see the applications of artificial intelligence broadly in different domains which are more close to us in the work culture like in artificial intelligence in hr and recruitment purpose so how this can be beneficial because hr has a, a lot a lot of load to look for a right candidature for a particular job so that's a kind of a problem we are we can transform into a machine learning a deep learning problem and where ai is an accelerator it allows uh, uh, the recruiters the ability to ingest a variety of data and provide context to a decision maker or employee or a business leader right so uh, what ai can do is is actually uh, using text analysis and matching pattern recognition it is able to match the right candidate resume with the job role 
right so where we can utilize artificial intelligence with the help of natural language processing um, algorithms right so using this uh, skill matching algorithms to match the roles to a skills of a candidate resume and provide recommendations based on the analysis that ai can do for us in the recruitment domain and the job if we we'll, uh, closely look at the job of a recruiter that is a time pressured and a complex job so this ai can be used in the setting to predict how long a job requisition will take to fill based on a historical data allowing recruiters to reprioritize as needed right so it can predict also when uh, with these set of resumes or uh, with this matching how how much time will it take to fill this job uh, with the right candidate right so ai is also doing wonders in sales and marketing right so it many recommendation platforms i already discussed there so there are opportunities i can a huge help in prioritizing opportunities for sales people identifying which opportunities need their attention which is especially important for volume sellers who may be managing many deals at a time so i can be utilized there as well right so if we look at the ai um, aspect of ai in sales so it can increase uh, customer relationship management adoption it can improve productivity data driven sales coaching improve forecasting pipeline analysis and deal intelligence uh, these the deals with intelligence right the customer deals right so it can do self healing contact database it means when you talk to a customer since that time to the end where the customer will buy your order or purchase it till that time ai will generate a pipeline that when you have to follow up the customer uh, after how many intervals and how much the customer was interested in our order and uh, order and sales marketing so that's kind of a large um, uh, what i will say a large pipeline will be generated uh using artificial intelligent tools are there are very um, like many tools are uh, available in the mar market one is dynamics 365 that's a microsoft product that are used by many companies for this ai purpose like uh, sales in ai purpose right sorry ai in sales purpose i'm so sorry so artificial intelligence uh, can also used for loan loan granting it means it can properly check the parameters that people are fit in to provide loans right so different uh, machine learning and ai algorithms can be utilized in there right so it can look for uh, the uh, the person uh, all aspects of that person like its uh, income and all and assets etc and look for to provide the predictive analysis like how much loan can be provided to that person depending upon its uh, credibility and assets right so that's how ai can be used for this banking and finance and we know how artificial intelligence can be used for neural style transfer we can use gans for this purpose right so this cost function look like a gan function gan the objective function so ai in life sciences means um, depend depending upon this is the problem of uh, bird net and over uh 10 bird call identification over 10000 bird species occur in the world uh, basically the ai objective is to detect is to identify which species of bird is chirping now uh, just now right so with the different bird images as well as bird chirping data like their sounds a bird net model is generated so that's how ai can also help in life sciences right so artificial intelligence can also been used in healthcare and what ai can do is or machine learning can do in the health industries to improve accuracy of diagnostics optimize host hospital processes such as resource allocation so these are few important things uh, um are basically are being um, uh use in healthcare every day that the persons like the patients should be provided a particular date and time and the doctors will be available so there is a resource allocation process right and if there are some radiologists which are working in a particular um, setting then uh if our algorithms will do some basic task of image screening of mri or ct scan images then radiologists uh, their cost can be 
cut that cost can be reduced on a hospital so like this there are many different um, areas or subdomains where artificial intelligence can be applied like precision medicines precision surgeries right so providing uh, different suggestions for depending upon the patient symptoms there are many tools available in the market where uh, depending upon the patient symptoms uh, the the tool will suggest the required medicines a doctor can prescribe like for like uh, if you check the case of homeopathy there are for every small uh, difference in a symptom there is a different medicine so like this kind of things can be uh, like art artificial intelligence can be very helpful to understand and discover the drugs right so these are few uh, examples of artificial intelligence where it can be used for resource allocation and proper patient flow right so there is one more thing we can discuss under healthcare one is anomaly detection like uh, scanning the images of mri or uh, um uh, x rays etc so artificial intelligence can look for the area and look for the anomalies right present in this area it actually do um, pyramid kind of a structure it generates to look at every pixel of an image and where the anomaly is present right so excuse me ma'am can i uh, know how much time i left uh, for to bind up my presentation ma'am you have 10 more minutes ma'am we if possible we could wind it wind up the session by 12 okay thank you so thank you. yeah so it's okay so i'll be able i think i'll be able to wind up uh, within 10 minutes right so we we look for in the pathology we look for automated uh, detection of relevant findings like detection is valued and these are the some areas i'm discussing in here which is used in the area of ai in healthcare right so we can skip these examples i already discussed the main points we need to discuss in here right so let's uh, skip these things. Huh. There is one more applications of artificial intelligence, so which is which is providing uh, the help to the persons which are differently abled, right? So it can provide amputated leg or a hand. Even uh, a small babies can have hearing aids, which are providing them the uh, actually how the environment is. They are able to perceive the environment better, right? So it is providing that kind of innovative products to the persons which are specially abled and they are able to perceive the world similar as we can do, right? So now like, let's look at the COVID related artificial intelligence uh, innovations happened in the world. So one is InfraVision that's trained a computer vision system to detect signs of pneumonia on lung tissues shown in CT and scans, helping to elevate a shortage of human technicians technically needed to interpret this data, right? So this InfraVision is, uh, is a company which trained a computer vision system. And similarly, there are municipalities uh, using uh, natural language processing from Yaidu Cloud to parse information from healthcare systems, helping them to track and predict the virus spread. Right? There is one more innovation, which is uh, uh, one province using um, mining lab technologies, machine learning platform to trace people who have come in contact with COVID carriers. So an infrared sensor, Athena Security, I think this is uh, really important for us when we have gatherings, which is scans a large crowd of people running a fever. When it spots an overheated individual, it uses a face identification to lock their identity and status in the cloud. So these are some useful applications which are um, developed during Corona times, right? So growth drivers what are the growth drivers of artificial intelligence in healthcare increasing individual healthcare expenses imbalance between health workforce and patients these are some growth drivers it means these are the problems people are facing and that's why different technologies and things are evolved over the time in healthcare including increasing global healthcare expenditure and continuous shortage of nursing and technician staff the number of vaccines for nurses will be 1.2 million by 2020 right so ai is and will help medical practitioners efficiently to achieve their task with minimal human intervention, right? So this is how AI is assisting us uh, 
to provide a better life right so the this is the spectrum of artificial intelligence used in medical imaging right? how it is uh, impacting the different aspects of healthcare so you can see a large number is here which is a population health which is uh, artificial intelligence is providing many uh, innovative uh, ways to deal with different uh, healthcare issues right so we can see how deep learning can be used to identify these two different um, areas where there is a issue with the people on their uh, uh, lungs right and pattern recognition to optimize echocardiogram evaluation so this is a one more research area we can work in here to optimize to look for the pattern recognition thing in these echocardiograms so this is also a very uh, prominent research area nowadays in the field of medical imaging and so we can uh, skip this so, yeah okay so basically what is what happened when we have our model prepared with this we have some things some issues when we want to deploy that model in a real time so what are those difficulties let's discuss those so basically we have to compress our heavy models to actually provide uh, to actually deploy it in a real time devices like mobile phones have limited storage like cameras have limited storage and capacity to process the things so we need actually less storage space to store our models and that model should be energy efficient low latency and lesser computationally expensive right so if we deploy these models uh, in our real time then we then sometimes we have to compress the models and on compressing the accuracy may reduce so so there are some of the techniques we will not talk about which are used for the compression purpose such as pruning quantization weight matrix factorization and convolution architecture right so pruning is one of the technique we will discuss first so this is a simply um, spectrum of a baby a newborn baby newborn baby and how the brain uh, synapses are formed during the evolution years so we can see that in the beginning they are less but from 6 month to 2 years there is a complex reconstruction construction of synapses formed in the brain which are connecting different neurons in the brain so after some years like 4 to 6 years we can see there are some synapses are pruned so that we only remember the things we see every day right so there is a um, uh, after training we have a if we apply the similar mechanism on artificial neural networks so we have options to prune the weights like these are connections we are calling these weights so we can prune some of the weights like why we are pruning it because we want to compress our model so that we can deploy that model in the real time and there is one after after uh, removing some of the weights we have these kind of values we have so how much impact that will happen on our final uh, outcome so maybe there is a, a small um, like there is some less accuracy we will receive on the on our smaller devices <coughs> so this is one more research area we can look for how we can do the pruning of the model so that can be deployed in the real time and one more uh, way of pruning is to remove the neuron from there if the uh, neuron will be removed from a particular place the all the connections which are there with this neuron only will be removed so this is one more way of pruning right so if we prune the neuron then this removal of uh, these things will happen and like in the a uh, column thing there will be removal weights are removed with the which are associated with the particular neuron and if we remove some of the inputs or the weights then there will be horizontal reduction <coughs> so a research problem is that not all parameters are weights are important so we have to identify which parameters to remove or how many parameters can be removed right to do the uh, model compression 
So lower the overheads of deep learning model and we reduce the parameters of the model from convolutional or dense layers. How that that we need to discuss now, right? So if we have a trained neural network architecture, then we will prune unimportant or redundant parameters from there to get the optimized model, which requires less computation energy and storage with improved latency for real time application. And so that we can deploy that thing in mobile phones, drones, robots, glasses, self driving cars or, or Raspberry Pis or Arduinos right, to generate automated devices. So this is uh, what the year of COVID-19 and we have so many things happened like diagnosing of pa patients, identify who is at more risk, developing drug faster, finding existing drugs that can help us and predict the spread of disease and predict the next pandemic. So these are different things we have currently dealt with uh, and are also dealing with in the Corona times, COVID times, right? So I can skip all of these things. Yes, so if we have to do a large, uh, if we, we have to generate a good algorithm, uh, we need, we should have a large data with us. And if we have large data, so major problem is to how to utilize that data, right? How to deal with privacy of data, government regularities, data sharing policies, and how we can put, can we put entire data on a client or server? Because when we have such problems in the healthcare, there is a large amount of data. Images of MRIs and scan, uh, X-ray scans are very, um, are very large. Actually, they do not open in your simple machines. So we have to put those things in a cloud. So how we will store that data? That's the problem we usually face uh, when we have to process uh, data, pre-processing and cleaning, right? So for that purpose, there is uh, one uh, thing that we can currently look into that is federated learning, which actually is enables machine learning models to learn on a private data without moving the data or and comprom compromising its privacy, right? So what has, what can be done is we, the global models using machine learning, global models are prepared and those models are trained at the respective hospitals. And then we can combine those models and we can get a private data that is trained on that model. So this is federated learning can federated learning can be very useful on such domains when we have large amount of data coming from various resources which have different um, types of uh, arrangement in it, right? So how to maintain data privacy. So differential privacy allows us to make formal mathematical uh, guarantees around privacy preservation when publishing our results and encrypted computation allow machine learning to be done on data while it remains encrypted. So that is how we can uh, do the data privacy. E even with data privacy, we can apply machine learning techniques, right? So basically the conclusion is the model compression can help to deploy the model in the point of care devices and federated learning can allow us to train our model on data from multiple institutions, hospitals and clinics without sharing the patient data. And this can provide insights of existing data such as X-ray, CD scan, blood reports, etc. Right. So now thank you so much for um, listening to me for one and a half hour. So thank you, ma'am. If there are any questions, I'm happy to um, answer those. Yeah, the session is now open for questions and discussion. Participants, you may ask questions if you have any. May I also post your questions in the chat box. So we have a hand raise. Uh, Amira, ma'am. She has left the meeting.
So I hope we don't have any questions. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Yeah, we have a question in the chat box, ma'am. Should I read it for you, ma'am? Yes, yes. I can read this, ma'am. Can GANs can be used okay, for fine. medical imaging field? Yes. Uh, um, so, um, okay, ma'am, that can be used for medical imaging field. Like, um, if we want to generate a data and look at the closer insights of that data, like that is uh, having some um, mechanism, like it is a, it is doesn't have any um, like um disease in it or any part of the area which is affected we can pro take the data distribution and then we can work using gans by applying discriminator and generator characteristics to look for the data whether we are getting some data which is actually having the thing the actually having this uh, disease or not so yes gans can be applied to medical imaging feeds no, no issues they can be applied Okay, hierarchical features like are you talking about uh, different layers of uh, neural network architecture where we need to look for features or it's in different context just please put on the context as well as like different layers of deep learning architectures we get the features from there are you talking about those hierarchical features or are you talking about something else then in that context i'll answer yeah ma'am yes uh, uh, nice session uh, i have a doubt uh, while uh, we are applying gan for a medical images actually in the generator part we are uh, augmenting the image right uh, so uh, actually, uh, is it uh, possible uh, in case of medical images, uh, we are uh, generating new images from the old one, right. so that it will be uh, used to uh, train the discriminator part, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, is it possible uh, to generate uh, like that? Yeah, we can like we can use it both the ways as you were describing we can um, like from the images we can generate more images and we can look for patterns if they are shifting anywhere and we can look for uh, like is which kind of which area or the portion of the image is affected uh, if we provide the real input as well as the generated inputs and we just look for the compare both the things and we see that uh, really this Im this person's image is affected so we can use it in this manner as well as uh, you are saying that um, uh, we can apply different even we can apply different noise or things with the images or uh, the different portion or areas of image affected and then we can look for discriminator as well as generator in outputs for uh, like um, evaluation purpose so we can apply it both the ways um and there is one more. Yeah. welcome ma'am can we synthesize ct images from mri data if so how we can validate the correctness um like we have CT scan images from MRI data, right? So if so, how we can validate the correctness? Um, I'm, I, I don't have a further idea in this domain. I've worked on uh, some brain tumor images, MRI images only. So it's not uh, my area of expertise. Uh, Ma'am, uh, one more uh, uh, doubt. Uh, sure. How do you say 1D CNN uh, can be used for uh, text or image processing? Normally, the CNN uh, is used for this image analysis. How we can convert it for a other purpose, text analysis purpose, or a signal processing, or something like that? Right, right. So actually, one-dimensional uh, convolutional neural networks they actually uh, take uh, like if we have a sing if we want to if we have a feature map with us and we want to actually uh, reduce the size of feature map or or look into a particular uh, um, area or a neighborhood then 1d convolutional neural network is uh, very helpful because it, it looks for all the layers and looks for all the patterns of those layers and compress that data into a smaller feature map so 1d convolutional neural networks are very helpful for text mining as well as speech mining 
So in text processing also, we need to convert it into a feature map, one yeah. feature map, yes. and then we will be transferring yeah. to CNN. Yes, yes, we have a dictionary with us, and with this dictionary, we look for uh, how the features are like the words are converted into feature maps uh, using one hot encoding and that's how it works uh, so uh, which one will be the better uh, based on your expertise uh, this uh, rnn based text analysis or the 1d based text analysis like um, i think um, rnns with lstms are providing good results in this field right so I haven't uh, personally applied 1D convolutional neural networks on it, so I don't have much idea about that. So till yet, I've applied um, on sentiment analysis, I've applied RNNs with LSTMs to generate, to get the hidden representation of data. So I, I have a proper understanding of that and I know how they look, how, they de how to deal with that and how it is able to generate good results. Okay, okay, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. We have another question in the chat box. Uh, Medical images are usually high resolution. Feeding them directly into CNN is partially not feasible. Any suggestions? Um, if we actually provide um, filter if we apply filtering on medical images like it it will uh, reduce it will actually blur the image or sometimes it can uh, actually compress the image and maybe the portion which we are concerned into will be uh, removed from the image then uh, that's not a good idea to apply uh, a filter before and then we need to provide the image what we can do is look for uh, some segmentation techniques and we can segment some portion of a affected area we will look for some of the pixels which are different from others in a particular area like or we, we can check it uh, with the uh, ground truth data and if the portion of an image is different from ground truth data we can do segmentation and then we can um, annotate that part of the image and then we can apply uh, for it for the training purpose so that's how we can work on medical images if we do not want to provide high resolution image high resolution images to the uh, neural network model so this is one way we can do thank you sir Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for the informative session. Uh, on behalf of the organizing committee and department of CSC MBCT, I express my sincere gratitude to Ms. Jaya Gupta for accepting our invitation and making this session a fruitful one. I thank the participants for the active participation in the session. The participants are requested. Yeah. The participants are requested to fill the feedback form. The link is shared in the chat window. So the next session will begin at 1.30 p.m. All are requested to join on time. And we have come to the end of the session. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So can I leave now? Yeah, sure, ma'am. Thank you.